uh, we'd always think about, you know, who we are. Uh, we'd talk about, you know, where I worked or talked about my children, talked about things that I owned. And today we're going to talk about the power of identity is talking about what God has done for us. And when we can take what God has done for us and understand that our identity is in the power of God's hands, we can take and have a better identity than we could ever have on our own. Now, all the, th all the way through the Bible, the Bible talks about things that, that we should or should not do. It tells us if, if we're believers in Christ, we should put on the armor of God. It tells us what we have to do in order to be what God wants us to do and what he wants us to be. What I'm going to talk to you today about a couple of scriptures that talks about who you, the body of Christ, the church of Almighty God, who you are. And when we think about who we are, we think about what God has done within our life. This is a, a, a challenge to the identity of the church, to the identity of the individual that's part of the church. So when we're talking today, we want you to put on the identity of God. We want to understand that God wants to do something greater than you could possibly do in your own identity. It's not just a name badge. It's an identity badge. It is who we are in Christ. Here's what the scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation. You know, a chosen generation, which is really neat about that, is God chose Israel in the Old Testament, protected them, loved them, helped them, and provided for them, and he was their provider. Now that Jesus came on the scene, the church of Almighty God, it is God's provider. The church is God's chosen one. We are his. He died on the cross for us. We are his church. We are his identity. We are his feet to do great things for him. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into that marvelous light, who, were, who once were in a people, but now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy mercy. You were in Satan's family, and God adopted you and put you into his family. There was an adoption process that took place, and that adoption took place outside of Satan's family, and God says, I want you, and he brings you into God's family, and that adoption, that toga, that adoption is secure. And when we are adopted and put into God's family, God gives to us some wonderful things. And those wonderful things are the things that we want to talk about today. We have to ask the question, why do we fail in the identity process? Why do we always get our identity from the past, our failures, and our hurts? Sometimes Satan wants nothing more than to cause you never to look at what God can do for you, but always to look at your failures of your past. Many of us, as we were growing up, things were said to us, things were done to us, issues happened with us, and those things that have happened has implanted in our psyche, and we get our identity because of our failures and because of people of the past. Satan has whispered into our minds that you could never do that. You will never do that. God would never forgive you of that. And we whisper into our minds and we replay that over our minds over and over and over and over again to the point that we believe the very lies of Satan. We can understand what God says in the word, but we believe the negativity way over the positive and we put our identity wrapped up in the lies, wrapped up in the past, and our identity is us. What I can do what I haven't done, what I should have done. And we look like a failure, we act like a failure, we act like the world is against us, our identity is in us. And if we look at what God can do for us, we have a greater power than Satan's power. God has defeated Satan and he has wrapped, uh, he, has, he has caused him defeat and despair, but Satan wants more than anything else to cause trouble psychologically, and in depression, 
and cause you to fail and believe that you are nothing. So that simple word identity, a simple word of identity, identity is a person's idea or expression of their self. It is an expression of yourself. If I would ask you, what is your identity? What is, what is it that you would want people to know about you? And I asked you guys to find some things about individuals and talk to them a little bit about what they did and, and where they worked and maybe their kids. And we talked and, you know, I found out where a few people work and that they have a few kids. And that's good because that's part of our identity. And that is a temporal identity. But there's something greater than a temporary identity. That's eternal identity. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy mercy. There's something that we can look at. If we were doing counseling, I would ask you some of these simple questions. The first question is, what? Uh, what do you stand for? What is, what, what is it that, that you're going to stand for? What, what is it that you stand for? What is it that you cry about? What is it that you, you would die for? And when, when we look at, in counseling, what is it that we get our identity from? What is it that we strive for? What is it that we want? Because we cannot figure out where we're going until we understand what is it that I want? What is the ultimate goal? What is it that we desire? And in our spiritual condition, our identity should be, what is it that I ultimately desire? I want my identity to be in Christ. If the scripture is true, and Jesus died for me, and if the scripture is true, that he has forgiven me of my sins, and the scripture is true, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My identity isn't in my strength. I can humbly say before God, I need you. I need you to fix me. I need you to help me. I need you to take care of me. I can't do this on my own. What is it that I want? I need to understand in my heart, in my life, what is it in my identity that I need God to take over? What is it? What do I stand for? And I like this because what God stands for ultimately is his very nature is God is love. His nature is love. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, it says, Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, and be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. We can be strong, but everything that we do must be wrapped up in the loving nature of God. When we do anything outside of the attribute of God, that is love, what we do is we are acting in ourself and we're not acting for Christ. So everything that we do, our identity must first be wrapped up in love. So what do we stand for? And then who do you stand with? Who do you stand with? In Proverbs 13, 20, whoever walks with wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. So if I get my identity, I need to understand who do I stand with? What is it in my life that is causing me to go to and fro and causing me to fail, causing me to feel like I'm a failure. I need to look at that and I need to understand who it is that I need to stand with. And I understand that I need to have wise counsel. I understand to get the proper identity, I need to go to God and I need God to work within my life. So we have what, we have who, and then we have where. Where are you in life? You know, when we do marital counseling, premarital counseling, one of the things that we ask is, okay, you're here, and this is where you are right now. You fell in love, and you want to spend the rest of your life together, but you didn't just get here. You had a life to brought you here, and you're going to have a life after you leave my office, 
but you are right here, right now, for this time. And in every one of our circumstances, in every one of our lives, we have to understand we are here today because of the consequences, the issues of our past. God has fixed us, he's made us, and maybe even tested us, and sometimes Satan has even tripped us up, but we are here right now, and what we have to do is we have to deal with now. We can't deal with where, and we can't deal with tomorrow. What we have to do is, what am I, who am I, where am I right now? If I can't deal with that issue, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm blinding myself to the true identity that what God wants for our life. And I like this verse in Colossians chapter 2, verse 7. Let your roots grow down into him, and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth. You were taught, and you will overflow with thanksgiving. Our identity has to be tied up in what God wants for your life. When we get the identity that I am God's child, I am a royal priesthood. I am a chosen generation. I can say, this is where I am, and I, I know that I've made mistakes. I know that I, that I am not perfect, but I know that this is where I am, and I can ground my life, my roots. I can ground everything I have in him. I can get into the word. I can focus on him. I can love him because right now, if my identity is in myself, I am always going to look at the past. I'm always going to look at my failures. I'm always going to listen to Satan's lies because I am weak. I can do great while I'm at church. I can do great when I'm around 30 or 40 people and we're talking about the Bible. I can do great when I'm around positive individuals. But you know what? I don't live around positive individuals every day. I don't go to work every day with positive individuals. We do have issues. So as long as everything's wonderful, I can stand firm in Christ. But if everything falls apart, if things take place, I start listening to the things of fear, the things of Satan. I start listening to the lies of my past. I start remembering the things that I failed at in the past, and I start looking at my identity on those things. I can remember the coach saying, you know, you probably ought to pick another sport. I remember my mom saying, or my dad said, I think your mom wants you in the kitchen. You know, you, I, I, you could hear people making fun of you and, and laughing at you. And, and, you know, you've done nine things great, but you do that one thing that's not right. And Satan always, what? Sneaks up and he puts that into your ear. And he makes you think, I don't care about the nine things that you can do wonderful. You are a failure because of the one. And he whispers that into your ear. And he whispers that over and over and over. You go to church and you don't hear him. You read the Bible, you don't hear him. But you're alone at night, laying in your bed, watching TV, reading a book. All of a sudden, he creeps in. Starts whispering again. And so often, until we can stop him in his tracks, the whispers of the silence of our past creep in and give us identity that we believe that is a false identity. Then we have to ask the question, why do we take this stand? Why do we take this stand? The why binds all of our choices together. The why. I would ask that question with anybody that comes into the office. Why are you here? Why are you here? There's a, a why in the road, a decision that has to be made, and this scripture that we're talking about is to the children of God. When you have to make an identity issue, when you have to make a choice within your life, you have to on purpose spiritually say, why? Am I willing to make the choice to get my identity in Christ and say no to the things of the past, say no to Satan's influence, say no to people around me that is not causing me to do the right thing, to keep my identity on myself, and my identity cannot be my name. It has to be who gave me my life. James chapter 2, verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. 
Love is my motivator. I want to serve God, not because I want him to love me. I want to serve God because he loves me. Here's the deal. It's an awesome thought. You, God can't love you anymore. He loves you as much as he possibly could love you. God is love. But you can't do anything more wrong for God to love you any less. God loves you. Now, when we were adopted out of Satan's family into God's family, you were adopted. You were giving all of his spiritual rights. When we say, why is it? Why is it? Because it's important to understand, when I say, yes, I want God, when I say, yes, I accept Christ, when I know that I have been identified with Christ, he does great things. And it is the, the win. Are we willing to take a risk, work with the pain, and go through the suffering of rejection to have acceptance? Sometimes before we can have the acceptance of God, we have go through the rejection. We have to say no to some things. We have to sever some relationships. It is hard. But sometimes in order to be fulfilled, we have to be severed. And those relationships that we have to sever that are harmful to us, that are very important to God. Now, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and your peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The win is very important. You understand why, what, how, but the when is very important. When will I actually see my identity in Christ? Let me ask you these questions. There are five of them. The first thing is when we realize that we are acceptable to Christ, that we're acceptable. We are a chosen people. Jesus chose to die on the cross. When we have given our lives to him, the church becomes the place where God's blessing dwells. Not the house, the individuals, because the Holy Spirit of God lives in the residence of every one of our lives. It is his dwelling place. He has chosen the church. He's chosen you, the body of Christ, to serve him. We get our identity because the Holy Spirit of God lives and dwells within us. We are acceptable because Jesus died on the cross and we have been bought by the power of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross and he died and we accepted him, we have more access to God because the Holy Spirit of God lives deep within us and that is the accessibility and the acceptance of Christ. And then lovable. We, we become lovable because we're not held to our sin. I love when, when we say we are lovable. God loves us. Now, I don't know when you talk about love, what, what all that's all about. You know, I, I know what 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, 4 through 8 talks about the love chapter. And, but when you, when you think about love, you just think about when somebody looks at you and you know they love you, they're tender, they're kind, they're gracious, they give you help, they give you encouragement, they give you peace, they give you comfort. When you're going through struggles, they come alongside you and they pick you up and they love you. Because being lovable means I don't have to go through my life alone. I, I know that I have access to God and I know my identity is in Christ. I know that I'm loved and I know that he loves me. I don't have to worry about going through everything alone. And then I love this. We're valuable. We are valuable. We, we, if you're going through some times where we're getting our identity from Satan or when people, what they think of us, sometimes we think, you know what, I'm just not very important. I just, nobody really cares. Nobody really needs me. Nobody really thinks of me. And I just don't feel like I'm very valuable. 
But in Christ, we are very valuable. But see, this is to the body of Christ. This is to the church. And when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, he gave to you the power of the Holy Spirit and he gave to you in that the gift that he wants you to have to serve, to serve others. The royal priesthood, the holy nation, the chosen people. We have a gift, a job to serve, to serve people with a pure heart because people are valuable to God. How? How do I know that people are valuable to God? Because when sin entered this world, God made a plan to redeem you and I. It was so important that the brokenness of humanity and the sin of humanity could not satisfy. So God sent his son Jesus to redeem mankind from their sin. It is so important that when I gave my life to Christ, I'm part of something that's so valuable it's called the church. And the church is so valuable to Christ because it is the witness. It is the tool to share the word of God around the world. Not only I'm forgiven, not only I'm valuable, but I'm forgiven. If we could comprehend forgiveness. Now we know we've all done stupid things. But the ability to look God face to face and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. And he, through his son Jesus Christ, says to us, you are forgiven. It's you are paid in full. Satan, in his lies and his schemes, wants you to remember what you have done. He wants to trip you up in where you have gone, what you have said, and stupidity things that you have ever done. When it said paid in full, I love what the Bible says. The Bible says, Jesus, with your sins, with your sins, buried it in the deepest sea. Cast it behind his back. Separated it as far as the east is from the west. He says it will not be to his memory any longer. The word of God says that your sins are forgiven, gone, never to be brought up. If we understand that's what God has done for us, not even about eternity, we're talking about our sins are forgiven. Our sins are gone. Our sins have been paid in full. If you have sinned anything like I've sinned, I say praise Jesus for that. Because we all need that forgiveness. We all have gone too far. And this is what God does. He says, you are forgiven. What Satan says, he can't forgive you. What Satan will say, you've done too much. What Satan will say, that's a lie. There's no way that your sins would be forgiven. And we start listening to the lies of Satan. So what we do is we start bringing those sins back into our life. We start thinking about them in our hearts. We start thinking about them. We start reoccurring them. And God is saying, I have forgiven you. I have forgiven you. I have forgiven you of your past. I have forgiven you of your present. And I have forgiven you of your future because you are adopted into my family. You are my child. I am your sad. I am your identity. If it is your identity, you will fail. But if it's my identity, I can give you hope, I can give you peace, I can give you comfort, and I can give you a life. I am been forgiven. Anytime that you can say that, I am forgiven. It gives you peace, it gives you hope, it gives you something that you can't get in your own. You need God to be forgiven. And then it gives you the ability to be capable. It gives you ability to be capable. I love this scripture. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When I know that I am his child, that I know I have power over Satan, when I know I have the word of God for truth, when I know that I have been forgiven and my past is not going to hinder me, and I know that I have the power of God to move into the future, Nothing, nothing can stop me 
As long as I know I'm doing what God wants me to do, as long as I'm in God's will, I know my past can't hinder me, I know my future can't stop me, I know Satan can't trip me, and I know God is going to walk with me. And if I know that, I am very capable. I am very capable to keep my head up. I am very capable of looking people eye in the eye. I, have, I am fully capable of looking at my past and saying, I will not allow the past of my life to hinder what God wants me to do in the future. But it all depends on my identity. Am I who I was, or am I who God thinks I am? If I am in the scripture, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you have been proclaimed the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light, who were not people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have mercy. You are a people of darkness, now you're a people of light. You are a people without mercy, now you're a people of mercy. You have the ability to praise to God. My identity is totally in God, what God has done for me and what God wants to do through me. So the last question is, how do you do that? How do you transfer identity when Satan has stolen your identity? When Satan has stolen your identity, and you may come to church, and you may let everybody think that everything's great, and your identity is in Christ, and you understand you're forgiven, and you understand everything's great, and, and you can quote some scriptures, but when you go home, you struggle. You struggle with your identity. And Satan has stolen that identity. And you're, you're worried about your future. You're worried about what people think of you. It captivates you. You're worried about your past, and you feel like there's really no future because your identity is wrapped up in your ability. And our identity has to be wrapped up in God. So if Satan has stolen your identity, here's what you need to do to get it back. When you go on the website and you uh, Google what to do with stolen identity, they're going to give you these these five points. So when I looked at the website and I saw these five points, I thought, that's a sermon right there, but of course that's gonna be my conclusion, not the entire sermon, but um, here's what you need to do. The first thing is detect it's missing. You have to understand if something is wrong with your credit, if something's wrong with your identity, if somebody is using your information wrong, you have to first detect that it is wrong. Sometimes if we do not detect it, it could go bad in a hurry and our name, our, our, our information can be gone. It could take years, months to get fixed. We have to detect there's an issue. And in our identity, we have to be very self-aware of what I rely on. Am I in Christ or am I Bruce Thomas? Am I serving Christ or am I serving Bruce? Am I doing this for the cause of Christ or am I doing this for Bruce? Am I self-aware of my identity, knowing what Christ has done for me, knowing what God wants to do through me, and knowing where God is going to take me in the future? My identity has to be in Christ. I need to be very self-aware. The second thing you need to do is alert anyone who can help. Alert anyone who can help. You know, whether, whether it's a credit card information, whether it's your city government or, or wherever that identity was stolen from, whether it's overseas or whether it's local, we have to alert anyone that can help. Anyone that can help you accomplish your goal to get your identity back. Spiritually, what we need to do, anyone that can help, we need to ask God. Because you can't give me the proper identity. Only God can give me my identity. I need to ask God, God, I have lost my identity. I am so focused on me, what I have done, or what I used to do. I am not focused on you. I need to pray, alert anyone that can help. I need to pray to God to give me the peace. And then close any compromised accounts. Close any compromised accounts. And some of us, that would probably be a very good thing just to cut them up and cancel them. Close any compromised accounts. Now, where that is spiritually, in our identity, if somebody or a group of people 
are keeping us from doing what God wants us to do, we may need to close some compromising relationships. If, if we only act a certain way when we're around a certain group of people, but that's not who we truly are, but that's who they truly want us to be, but when we do what we're doing with them, it's not who we really want to be, but they like us, and I can get my identity from being with them, I'm changing my identity with God to be identity with somebody that I really don't like and I really don't feel comfortable doing. There has to be some pain, but we have to cut the accounts. We have to sometimes cut those relationships. Whether you're 15 years old or 51 years old, what we have to do is we have to say, I am not going to allow a person, a group of individuals to change my identity and to steal who I truly am. And then we need to take charge. We need to take charge. Change the things you can change. Because here's, if you've ever been on the phone with uh, insurance companies or banks, which, okay, here, here's the deal. Okay, time out for a second. This is Bruceology right here. If you, miss a, if you miss a house payment, they are going to call you, and they're going to call you often, and they're going to not be very happy with you, right? You try to call them to get a question answered, I was on the phone last week for 45 minutes listening to music. And I finally got excited when somebody came online and they said, I'm sorry, all the lines are busy. You'll be another 30 minutes. I thought, I'm just going to quit making a house payment. They will call me and I can get it all resolved. <laughs> the rudeness. But you know what? If you are allowing somebody to fix your problems, it'll never be fixed. If you call somebody and say, hey, somebody stole my identity, can you help me? Sure, we'll help you. You may call them a month down the road, oh, yeah, I lost that file. The only person that's going to fix your identity loss is you and God. Your wife can't do it. Your husband can't do it. Your family can't do it. Only you and God can fix your identity. And then the last one is we need to stay alert. It's happened in the past. It can happen in the future. If you don't take the proper steps, your identity can be stolen again. You can say today, you can say right now, I want my identity to be in God. I want to understand and I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I know that my foundation is secure in Christ. I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. I know that when I was 19 years old, I gave my life to Jesus Christ and my sins were forgiven. And I can put my foundation, my love, and my hope in Christ. I can do that. And I can have purpose behind that. But something could take place. A failure could happen. A sin could happen. And I take my eyes off of what Christ has done for me. And I start taking the eyes that I had on Christ and put them on myself. And the identity that I had on Christ then turns around and I put it on myself. It's so easy to lose your identity. It's so easy to be fearful of our identity. When somebody talks about Christ, talks about what Jesus has done, asks you a question about your spiritual life, and we shrink because we're embarrassed instead of stand because we're proud. We've lost our identity. I am the son of Jesus Christ. I have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. My sins have been forgiven. My life is secure. I am going to heaven. I am part of the greatest force upon the planet, and that is the power of God through the local church. I have part of God within my life called the Holy Spirit. In my own, I fail every day. With God, I am forgiven every day. In my own power, I am worthless. In God's power, I'm all powerful. I have identity. And my identity has nothing to do with being a pastor of a church. 
My identity has nothing to do with being the father of two sons. My identity has nothing to do with family, has nothing to do with church, it has nothing to do with my job, has nothing to do with what I have and what I do. My identity is wrapped up in what Jesus did. Before the foundation of the time, he looked down and he said, that people, they need Jesus. I'm going to give my son to this generation, to these people. And he's going to shed his blood for all mankind. And the Bible says, for whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you, me, when we said yes to Jesus, we have been chosen by God into his church to be part of something greater than ourselves. And that's the family of God today. To change the world today. Oh, we know where the end destination is. We know that when we close our eyes, we take our last breath, because we're part of the family of God, we're going to heaven. But God has given to us a purpose. He has given to us a reason to change the culture, to change your identity, to bring people in to the relationship with Jesus Christ, to allow our family and our friends to see him. That's our job. My identity, my identity is not Bruce Thomas. That's my name. My identity, I get to be a child of God. My title, I'm saved. I'm saved. My destination is heaven. And I can't do any of those things on my own. All those things come from God. That's where I want to get my identity. That's where I want to get my hope. That's where I want to get my help. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you, and Lord, we love you. Allow us never to forget who we are. Because when we know who we are, you can do great things with us and through us. And Lord, we thank you for giving to us the purpose, the love, the motivation, the comfort, that when we are identified with you, we can come victorious through any situation because you walk through us, through it, before us, after us. So Lord, protect us today. Help us. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Al.